Cool. Uh, thank you, Joe. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about frictionless data for wheat. And this is a project that we worked on at the Earlham Institute. Uh, it's myself and another guy called Xing Dong Bian, and we work for a guy called Rob Davey. I'll talk to you about it now. So to begin with, um, we are funded as part of a sort of infrastructure program that covers eight different research institutes and universities. And there's over 25 groups of scientists. And the idea is basically to try and increase the yield of wheat. So effectively by 2050, we need to produce 60% more wheat to meet global demand. So it's any, any research we could do to try and make that easier for users, uh, for people to get. So what do we do? under DFW? Well, we produce lots of scientific data and it can be of various different types. So we have field trial experiments, we have data sets, and we have um, genomic sequences amongst many other types of data. On top of that, we have also have different groups of users. So we have breeders that have particular needs and academics and data scientists and people in the industry and all requiring different needs from the data. So the challenge we have is how can we make this data accessible and usable for everyone? So our solution to this is we came up with a software platform called the Grassroots Infrastructure. And this is a suite of tools that wrap up industry standard software tools along with our own custom open source ones. And it works on the principle of communication between different systems all using a JSON API. So it's language, programming language and platform agnostic. And the idea is that these grassroots instances can be federated between each other and data and service can be shared. And also we try and make sure everything's done in a fair way. So if you don't know about fair, I'll just quickly run through those. So the four principles of fair data are, the first one is findability, as in can you find what you're looking for out of a system? So making sure the data is well described and can be searchable for both humans and users. Um, it needs to be accessible. So once people can find the data, can they access it? Do they need authentication or is it openly available and so forth? We have interoperability, so the idea that even though you've got open data, you need to make sure that it can be integrated into other systems, whether it be different workflows for analysis or so forth. So it needs to be well described. And if I, in terms of reusability, we might want to make sure that all the data is well described, so marked up and with detailed provenance. So now that I've given you a quick overview of fair data, I'll now go on to the grassroots infrastructure. So what we have, we have a set of common core libraries which take care of things of how we describe our parameters and our web service APIs, how you call different systems, writing, reading files, and so forth. And we have that attached to an Apache web server via our own Apache module that we write. So that connects all, the, all of the plumbing together for the system. And the bits that actually do the scientific analysis are what we call services. So this is either where we've taken adapted existing programs and we've wrapped them into our own sort of API, or we write our own bespoke tools. And as long as systems conform to our API, which is a well-defined set of standards and the JSON schema, then they can run inside it. So we have various different types of tools. So we have, we've taken existing tools such as BLAST, which is a, a really common one in bioinformatics, which is where you find out areas of similarity between different biological sequences, as well as our own sort of custom services like field trials, field pathogenomics, searching and stuff. And I'll come on and talk, chat about these in a bit more detail. So typically, when you do a web service interaction, say you want to go and do a search across two different systems for a particular sequence. Normally, if, in this case, you'd have two servers, one for the Earlham Institute here, one for the University of Bristol. You'd log into one system, do your search, and then you'd go across the other one and perform the same search and try and get your results. So the problem there is you happen to access each one individually. And then once you've done that, you have to collate the results together. And if you're anything like me, you're prone to human error and not um, cut and pasting things together properly. You might mistakenly run the services with different parameters, so you might not be able to compare them um, correctly. And it's time consuming. So one of the things we tried to solve with this idea is that the idea of federating services. So if two different places are running a grassroots instance, they can be hooked up together and all the services shared. So the idea being, it doesn't matter which one you log into, you see the same list of services and functionality. So on top of that, you can also add um, amalgamate services themselves. So the, the service can actually see the databases all on one system and all on the other, but to a user, they appear like they're in one place. So from a user's point of view, they just log into a system, they see a list of databases to search, search against, and they can just run their pro, run their analysis, and that's fine, they get the results back. Whereas under the hood, obviously there's communication between the two different systems and all the results get collated together. So that's an int a sort of introduction to grassroots. Now I'm now gonna talk about a couple of systems that we've done. So the first is, as, as part of this project, the DFW um, so program, we create lots and lots of data. And all of this we need to make available. So we have a data portal for this. 
And this is um, everything on this system is based upon the Toronto Data Agreement, which is an excellent license, which allows you to do pre-publication data sharing. So the idea is if you do some scientific analysis, you can make your data available for everyone else and they can access it straight away, but they can't publish on it until you have. So you still get first, first rights, if you like, but it makes sure that everyone else can do their analysis and pipelines with it much earlier than they normally would. So where we store this, we store it in a system called iRODS, which you haven't come across is an open source data management software and it's used by a variety of research or commercial organizations worldwide. And it has a number of sort of cool features. So one is that you can virtualize the data. Actually, it doesn't really matter. From the user's point of view, it doesn't matter where the data is stored. So you can shuffle it around on your servers and from their point of view, it doesn't move. It has data discovery, so because once doing the standard typical file and search things, you can also attach metadata to the files. So, for instance, if you have you run an experiment and you want to store the parameters you've run an experiment with, you can attach that as metadata to the results file. And if the results file gets moved around, the metadata stays with it. And in the same way that uh, we have the graph grassroots instances that can be federated, so too you can you can do that with the iRods, which is where we got the idea from. So what we did is we took a an Apache module and we forked it to make this available on the web. So the idea being that we can make the data appear in like a user-friendly environment, but add lots of extra features. So we want to expose the metadata so that can be displayed and that can be edited and give the, give the whole system a full REST web service API so people can program against it if they want to. So um, in terms of the metadata we store, we use the minimal information about a plant phenotype experiment or MyAPI. And that, that has a, um, a list of certain parameters or certain metadata attributes to store and keep. So we, we stick with that. On top of that, we have our extra fields. So we have things like the, the title of a project, the list of the authors, a description of it and license details, along with the actual data itself. And all of this gets indexed within our own um, search engine, which is based upon Lucene. Again, everything we do is open source. It's all available. Now, last year, we were lucky enough to uh, win a tool fund from the Open Knowledge Foundation, and with the goal being to expose these data sets, the data, the frictionless data packages. And if you can see in the little red box, we have a little data package JSON file. So what is friction data? I'm sure you've heard lots about it over the last day and a half, but just in case you haven't, it's a simple container format used to describe and package any type of data. And it's, it has many advantages, it's simple to use, can handle anything, it's easily extensible. You can package metadata in there and it's human editable and machine usable. I like the fact it uses reusers existing standards and because it's in JSON, it's language, technology and infrastructure agnostic. It's great, love it. So we've put, we put all of our data into that. So each of the projects on the DFW data portal now have these frictionless data packages automatically generated. It's not like the user has to go in and create it. And it contains all of the files that we have actually sitting on the website as well. So the things like the license, the name, the description, and so forth. We've done this by adding some extra functionality to the Apache module that I mentioned that connects to iRODS. So it has a number of features. So the first is it can, as well as dynamically creating these files, if they're particularly large or take a long time to generate, they can be cached and written back to iRODS. So next time that file can just be served. That's really good. And because it's in Apache, you can use all your standard Apache configuration directives. So you can just say that at a particular level in your file directory hierarchy, these things can have frictionless data packages generated. Obviously, we can't control what metadata keys people use to describe their data within iRODS. So all of this is completely configurable. So you can set up in your in your configuration, you can say use these iRODS keys to generate these frictionless data uh, metadata values. And you can, the iRODS metadata values can all be combined together. So you can take the, the results from multiple different metadata values, concatenate them together, and that becomes the frictionless data value that you see. So as well as the basic data resources, we also support tabular data resources. So these are typically things like spreadsheets or CSV files. And in much the same way, all of the column headings and variable types, again, completely configurable and can be pulled from the iRod system. So we try to make it as little with no hard coding as possible so that anyone can configure it for their own systems. So the second thing I'm going to talk about are field trials. So field trials are experiments where um, scientists will, will put loads of different crops within a field and apply different treatments to them, could be fertilized and so forth, and then measure particular traits. It could be how quickly it takes for the crop to grow or how high it grows or so forth. So we worked with the data producers or within DFW and we came up with a standardized template for 
template for submitting the genotype, which is the genetic material of the crop, i.e. what type of seed it was, and the phenotypes you want to store, which is the, typically the characteristics you want to measure, like I mentioned plant height and so forth. And we're trying to facilitate all of this so everything is, we're, we're keeping the fair share, share principles in mind with everything that we produce. So in terms of findability, we have a, a Google Maps type approach where you can go in and you can zoom in on the map and search around to find any trials that are in a particular part of the world. So, or alternatively, you can go in for a normal text-based search web page, but you, eventually you come down to a particular um, set of studies. So all everything we do is openly accessible and they all have unique identifiers that are fixed URLs. So you can, they're accessible and can we, we will keep them those addresses so people can reference to them and know they're still carrying on existing. In terms of interoperability, as well as having the grassroots API, we also have adopted something called BRAPI, or the Breeding API, which is an, a community-driven standard for developing a web service API for enabling interoperability between different plant breeding databases. So that's another API that we've, we use. In terms of what we actually store in a system, we have GPS um, files for where the plots are within a particular um, field. So as well as storing lots of different metadata, such as a description of a particular study, what is trying to calculate any design notes or anything like this, we also have these for the on the individual plot level. And we've allowed automatic map updating. So someone can have with their phone or tablet and walk through the field and know which plot they're on. So they can then tap on that and see the details of that plot to try and make it as useful as possible. So what we store for the plots? Well, we have lots of um, generic data, such as its dimensions, its length, its width, when the crop was sown, when it was harvested, and any um, user comments of the person putting it into the field. You can also attach images, that they, and they can be either take, obviously taken via camera, or we can have drone-based images, along with what crops have been sown there, where the accession and seed, so you can actually get, you can go and order the seed for that particular variety that's sown in that particular plot. And then obviously what people do, they're interested in measuring stuff. So we, the phenotypes are, or the measurements that we people are interested in are typically comprised of sets, uh, core or triple of values. The first is a trait, as in what to measure, and this could be the plant height, this could be how long it takes to grow, the method of how it was measured, the so next part, and finally the unit. So it could be, if you're measuring height, it could be in centimeters or in meters or so forth, along with the value and potentially a date. Now, all of, all of this stuff and everything that we do and all the data we store, we try to make sure it's well-defined, they're well-defined terms. So everything we do comes from the crop ontology. So everything is marked up and has proper provenance from there. So as I mentioned, we've got a couple of web service APIs, the grassroots and Brappy. But another thing that people requested that we work with is they're not, the, they're way experts in the field, way, way better than me, but they're not necessarily comfortable scripting or programming, and they just want to get the basic data. And an ideal solution for this, and I'm not, I'm not being paid to plug it, is frictionless data. So what we've done is we've come up with a load of schemas for the different um, classes of data we, have, we store, whether it be studies, the data and the plots and so forth. And we package those all into a frictionless data package. And we're not just the only people on DFW working on frictionless data. We have collaborators such as Richard Oslo at Rotham Research, who's working in a similar field and doing data carpentry lessons in, in frictionless data. So what do we store? Well, we've got within the frictionless data packages, these are all, again, all automatically generated. The user doesn't have to do anything. Um, we have the various different data resources. So one for the program that's in, then the field trial, then the study that's inside that, and then the plot data. So we all of the fields that we have in there are standardized. And on, actually on a study level, as I mentioned, there are standard attributes, such as length and width and position and stuff. Well, Specific to each individual study, you might be having different treatments or measuring different phenotypes. So all of that, again, is, is calculated with the software and it automatically creates the spreadsheet, including these values. So it might not be easy to see from the screen on there, but um, this is an example of one of the sets of tabular data we've got, and it shows the particular phenotypes that, within that study. Simon, just to say, you've got about four minutes left. That's awesome. Thank you, Joe. Um, so as well as exposing this to the frictional data package, we thought, well, can we make this even easier for users to use? But so I know that frictional data has great APIs and great tools in Python and stuff, but could we make it even simpler for them to unpack the data? So there's another thing we've been working on. It's a tool to extract resources from within a data, frictional data package. And the way this works, it's a standalone tool that you can download. Um, again, it's open source with the link at the bottom. And the idea is that it will read the 
the contents of a frictionless data package. And for each data resource within it, it will look at the schema that it uses with the profile attribute, go over to the internet and download it, and then write out all of the data resource fields using from that schema. So currently, we support the data resor resources being written out into either Markdown or HTML, but we're looking to add more different types. And any tabular data resources, we, we can take them out with CSV. This tool is cross-platform, as we plan to make it available for as many different platforms as possible, and there's absolutely nothing weak specific in it. So it could work with any frictionless data package that you'd like. And the URL is there for the pre-release version. Hopefully, we'll have proper releases soon. So in terms of further work, well, we want to add frictionless data as many different places as possible within our systems and add machine learning to try and detect the intypic values from media such as photos. And we're looking to try and standardize on frictionless data schemas between different types of field trial experiments. You might have one, we typically work with ones that are over a single year, but in some institutions, they, they work over 10, 15 years and so forth. So finally, I've got lots of acknowledgements of people that we work with, so various different people that work um, across the FW that we've, have helped us enormously. So at the Earlham Institute where I work and at the John Innes Centre, Rothamstead, Rothamstead Research, as I say, and University of Bristol. And finally, a big thank you to the CSV Conv organisers for inviting us. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And um, thank you. Thank you from us to presenting. That was a really great talk. Thank you very much. Cheers, Joe. <laughs> I, um, we do have a question. I'm just... Ooh going to see so we're going to give you again a very short answer for this one so maybe you can um, yeah. answer it in a bit more detail later because we've got the keynote starting in two minutes okay. can you tell, tell us a little bit about your users um it's a question that i had as well actually so yes so we we have um within the institutes themselves we have lots of research scientists that are particularly um trying to do to get this data and like work out what particular things they might be, particular phenotypic values we also have breeders that are trying to work out whether there are particular seed lines that they can cross, as in like, you know, have two parents for and try and come up with a, a species that's particularly hardy to against, say, a particular disease or a particular characteristic. Um, you might also have people working in industry that are doing similar things. And we have academics. So we have like a variety of different users. And that that's part of the challenge is going, well, you can't just, you, you can't have a one size fits all. You've got to make it so that everyone can get what they need out of it. 